You're listening to Faith in 20, an out-of-the-box, grace-based ministry rooted in the great news of Jesus Christ. As with all God's children, I'm a competent minister of a new covenant, taught all things by the Holy Spirit. Have a question or two? Sick of the modern church model or just looking for context on scripture? Then I've got you covered, so stick around. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. I hope you had a chance to take in and digest the previous two episodes, which form the introduction to the Divine Council worldview, because today we're going to keep cruising along. We're already in episode 35, getting to know God's other family. So now that we've looked at evidence for the existence of a divine family that actually mirror us and that they too are imagers of Yahweh, just in a different way, and have also looked at how certain events in the Old Testament, such as the Tower of Babel incident, played a role in changing the geography of the nations, and even how this carried over into the New Testament, as well as being heavy on the minds of New Testament writers, such as Paul, we're now going to circle back, as far back as humanly possible, and take a look at the origin of God's other family. We're also going to be providing further evidence as to why passages referring to the divine council are in fact speaking about divine beings and not humans. Since releasing the first episode on the divine council, I have had some messages from folks who are curious as to why this has been so veiled in the church, especially since it took pretty little effort, I would say, to unveil this concept in the text, and not a text that I somehow modified, (laughs) but the true text. It's all laid out there for anyone who has eyes to see. I think the answer is the same as to why most of us who attended church didn't really notice a distinction in the covenants, or assumed we were still bound by this so-called moral law that's nowhere to be found in scripture. We place our trust in folks who claim to be educated in the matter, and our brains go on autopilot when our butts hit the pews. Let's be honest about that. Unfortunately, we can't count on another person to give us what we need when it comes to healthcare, politics, how we choose to be educated. We have to maintain autonomy, and spirituality is no different. For me, I hit a ceiling in church. I was a carnivore going back only to be fed pablum. My spiritual muscles were atrophying from lack of growth. You won't ever hear this stuff in church. It's not worth their time to teach it, even if their eyes were open to it. So essentially, when it comes to supernatural elements in the Bible, we're taught to keep them at arm's length. Whenever an odd passage comes up that appears to be referring to, oh, I don't know, the sin of the watchers or Enochian literature, it's pushed aside to the peripheral and everyone just ignores it. After all, our church fathers said, there's nothing to see here, folks, so perhaps God just made a mistake by putting those passages in scripture. Ironically, none of that stuff is any more odd than the creator of the universe incarnating himself as a baby and needing to be potty trained by his own inferior creation. Of course, we have to accept the Godhead model as supernatural as that is, because otherwise there'd be no point to Christianity if we didn't. Although, thanks to the Trinity model, even that has been perverted by the Reformation. But, moving on back to God's household, when we open the Bible and start reading Genesis, most of us get the impression that before God laid the foundations of the earth, he was just hanging out all by his lonesome. Not the case. He had company, and no, not the other members of the Trinity. Let's put aside the Trinitarian thinking for a moment and start fresh. God's divine family, the assembly of holy ones, heavenly hosts, sons of God, council members, they were all present and witnessed the creation of the world. Now, in the previous episodes, I mentioned that we were going to look at Job differently. How many of us have glossed over Job chapter 38 verses 4 to 7 and assumed that God was speaking to humans? Where were you at my laying the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you possess understanding. Who determined its measurements? Yes, you do know. Or who stretched the measuring line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars were singing together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? 
If we're talking about the foundations of the earth, then clearly God isn't speaking about human men when he says sons of God shouted for joy. It might be tempting to assume that sons of God is just another term for angels, since our modern world tends to limit supernatural beings to angels, but that would be incorrect too. Just as I explained in the previous episode, the Old Testament lays out a hierarchy for divine beings, and sons of God are never used to describe angels. The sons of God, or B'nai Elohim, maintain a higher status than the angels. The Hebrew Bible never uses sons of God and angels parallel to one another. The sons of God are the ones we touched on in the last episode who made the conscious decision to rebel against God, beginning in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Now, angel, or malak for messengers, is still an important role, but whose tasks are limited to delivering messages. Angel doesn't describe what a being is, only what their job is. Now, the phrase morning stars that we just read in Job, however, does refer to the sons of God. This is one of those times when understanding cultural context outside of your English Bible is going to be very helpful. Astral religion and celestial mythology were very popular in the ancient world, and many of the Israelites at this time thought of the stars as living entities. For example, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, we see the phrases morning star, son of the dawn, which are Halel bin Shahar. There is much to unpack in Isaiah 14 in terms of debunking a popular belief about a certain rebellious council member. But for now, let's just unpack this star language. All right. Son of the dawn was in reference to Venus. Although folks knew Venus was a planet, they referred to it as a star. It is the first small light visible to the naked eye when a new day dawns, just before the sun rises, a.k.a. morning star. This signified new life, a new beginning each day. This title actually makes sense since the sons of God were present to witness the beginning of life, or the creation of the earth. The stars were named in Psalm 147.4, they were created by God, Genesis 1.16, and they were considered part of the divine army. Look at Judges 5.20, Isaiah 40.25-26, Daniel 8.10, and Revelation 12.1-9. The fact that sons of God is so closely intertwined with this star language should also be a clear indication that we are talking about divine sons not human ones, and also not simply messengers. God doesn't use son language by accident. Just as in Acts chapter 17, verse 28, Paul speaks about us as the offspring of God. In him, we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. We are called children of God because we are true children of God. Because of the finished work of Christ, we have been brought near by the blood and adopted to sonship. This title is very specific. Just as in the Old Covenant, the Israelites were not called God's offspring, rather his servants or sons of Israel, but never sons of God. This phrasing represents true family, so that it should be no different to wrap our minds around the idea of God creating a divine family, that, like us, share common traits with him, yet remain separate until such time that our lowly bodies become transformed to be like that of Christ's glorified body, as Paul speaks to in 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, let's look at an example of how this divine star language makes reference to us. Now, most of us are aware of Genesis 15 when the embodied Yahweh approaches Abraham to confirm the promise he'd made to him in chapter 12. Verse 5 says, He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Stars from Genesis 15 is cross-referenced to the Psalm 147.4, which I alluded to earlier. He determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. Now, at first glance, when we read Genesis 15, it seems like God is using star language simply to refer to the quantity of children Abraham would have, that anyone with the faith of Abraham would be called children of Abraham. But in fact, this also refers to quality. 
So if you understand a bit about what's happening with this divine counsel language, you can read 1 Corinthians 15 with a Genesis 15 backdrop. Our bodies will become divine just like the stars or sons of God. We will experience the same quality. So in Genesis chapter 15, God is talking about the unification of both the number of children and the kind of children that Abraham would have. And if you understand the ancient Near East belief system and their ideas around cosmology and the divinity of the celestial bodies that we discussed earlier, then you will know that nothing I'm saying here is revolutionary. This is the context that laid the foundation for the text. So I think we've filled in some gaps here in terms of how God's family is really assembled. It wasn't just him and then some winged messengers flying around in the clouds. This is actually a very intricate system that mirrors the ancient world. God's kingdom does business in a similar way to many earthly kingdoms. What do I mean by this? Well, if we look at ancient Egypt and the structure of the pharaohs, which ironically means great household, pharaohs ran their household based off an extended family structure. Family members were appointed different positions and there was a hierarchy system in place. This sort of layered authority was well known throughout the ancient Near East. Psalm 82, which was our foundational passage in episode 33, mirrors this administration system. God, or Elohim, stands in the divine assembly. He administers judgment in the midst of the gods, Elohim. Well, I won't dive into this for a second time, since we rigorously unpacked this message already. Just be reminded that the word Elohim, it's a lot like the word sheep in English. It can mean either singular or plural. Because of this, much like the word sheep, we have to rely on grammar and sentence structure to guide us. We don't know whether we're talking about one sheep or more than one sheep until it's used in a sentence and we're able to grab the context. Make sense? As we established in the introduction episode, the first Elohim in Psalm 82.1 is singular and the second is plural. The words in the midst of provide that context I was talking about and lets us know that the singular is in the presence of the plural. Now, throughout the Old Testament, we see passages that distinguish Yahweh as the Most High. Not that he's the only Elohim, but that he is elevated and distinguished from all the other ones. And don't forget that we established in the last episode that the term Elohim is only referring to a being that resides in the spiritual realm. Remember, even the disembodied spirit of Samuel was referred to as an Elohim. Genesis 14, 18 to 22, Numbers 24, 16, Psalm 7, 17, 18, 13, and 47, 2 all refer to Yahweh as the most high above all other Elohim. B'nai Elon as opposed to Elohim or gods. Don't be fooled by other translations of Psalm 82. The Hebrew text presents him as the most high God above his lesser created gods. Remember, we looked at that in the ESV. Now, the New American Standard, for example, translates it as God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of rulers. Now, this doesn't make a lot of sense and leaves more questions than answers, to be brutally honest. The the biblical writers obscure this passage because they're worried that by using the correct Hebrew text, it would make this passage appear too much like a pantheon or a polytheistic god. There's no need to handle the reader with kid gloves here. Why would an understanding of the true translation take anything away from our worshipping the Most High God? Let's talk a little bit more about objections for a divine counsel point of view of Psalm 82 and why this can't be humans the God is speaking of, because I'm sure the church can come up with many to avoid what the text is actually saying. I think the most popular rebuttal for a divine counsel view is that Yahweh must be talking to other members of the Trinity in Psalm 82. First off, this can't be because not only is Yahweh speaking to these beings as separate from himself, but verses 2 to 4 let us know that he is judging them. And then in verse 7, he says that they will die like humans. Now, if that's other members of the Trinity, then this makes God seem really bipolar. 
At the end of this passage, we see that God is giving these divine beings authority over other nations, which we spoke about last time with regards to the disinheriting of the nations at the Babel event. Now, another viewpoint is that perhaps God was speaking about human Jewish leaders rather than divine beings. But how can this be? The Israelites were meant to remain separate from other nations, not put in position of authority over them. In fact, the covenant with Abraham from Genesis 12 makes this very clear. The human view would also not be taking into account the actual definition of Elohim as a place of spiritual residence. A human's home is in the physical world, not the spiritual one, at least not while they're embodied on the earth. So if we pair Psalm 89 verses 5 to 7 with Psalm 82, it clearly contradicts any hint of this being a human council. And so the heavens will praise your wonderful deeds, O Yahweh, even your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones, for who in the sky is equal to Yahweh? We don't have human leaders in the sky. Who is like Yahweh among the sons of God, a God feared greatly in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all surrounding him? This means that both Psalm 82 and 89 echo the context we see in Job 38, 7, God's divine family. The belief that starves were divine beings lends itself to the sons of God being metaphorically referred to as stars of God. In the beginning of Job, chapter 1, 6, and 2, 1, we see a group of these divine beings, or sons of God, presenting themselves before Yahweh. And then in Psalm 29, 1, we see the same language describing the sons of God. Ascribe to Yahweh, O sons of God, ascribe to Yahweh glory and strength. Ascribe to Yahweh the glory due his name. If you believe that this was talking about humans, then you would have to believe that the beings presenting themselves before God in Job are no more than flesh and blood, not divine family members. So, at this point, we understand that Yahweh is a unique Elohim, and while there are other Elohim, there are none like him. He is the Most High, who is uncreated and holds complete authority over all things on heaven and earth. Yahweh is uncreated while all other celestial beings are created, making them inferior to Yahweh. Now, in biblical theology, there is one uncreated being, thereby suggesting that all other created Elohim or residents of the spiritual realm are made of something. Just because they are invisible to us does not mean they, they are composed of actual material. Therefore, we know that the word Elohim does not represent a specific set of attributes, as we discussed earlier when I laid out all the different beings of the spiritual realm that are called Elohim. Rather, like us, they receive certain communicable attributes from Yahweh, but are still inferior created beings. So you can think of Yahweh as being a species all of his own. There are none like him. So this star or light language is actually echoed in the New Testament as well in James 1.17, where he calls God the father of lights. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. A divine being residing in the spiritual realm can certainly take on a corporeal body and visit the earth every so often to interact with humans. We see several examples of this, but this is not their normal place of residence, as they are still spirits. Just as we see examples of human beings brought up to the spiritual realm, it does happen, but it's not their usual domain. We see an example of this in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So here, Isaiah is getting a bird's eye view of a typical council meeting here. Then in verse 8, we see him participating in the meeting. This is his commission. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go out for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. 
So the spiritual realm is not Isaiah's normal domain, but he was brought in and received a task to carry out in his usual domain. So the human family and the divine family are like two sides of the same coin, and God chooses to use both groups of family members. Now, in the intro messages, I spoke about the Gentile nations being disinherited at Babel and being placed under the authority of created gods. Now, when Israelites abandoned their sacred space and started worshiping these gods, this created the basis for idolatry. Now, I think one of the biggest obstacles in folks understanding the divine council worldview is the fact that idolatry has been grossly misunderstood by Christians. Like many of us, when I first heard about idolatry, I assumed it just meant that people were worshipping inanimate objects, that only one Elohim existed, and people were making up these other entities that they put a face on by building random objects and wooden figures to worship. Turns out, in the context of the ancient Near East and Mesopotamia, folks understood that these were real and threatening entities behind the objects being fastened. In fact, if you're a history buff, you can read all about the ancient open mouth ceremonies that were performed where folks would actually call down the deity into the fastened idol by opening its mouth and nostrils so that they would secure a place to show up and interact with the deity inside a temple, for example. The idol became animated by the deity. This is something else that separates Yahweh from all other Elohim. We don't call Yahweh down. Yahweh is the creator, and we are the idols, essentially. He creates us to be his imagers. Other deities cannot create their own imagers, as they themselves are created beings. In Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, another one of our foundational passages, tells us that Yahweh divided the nations at Babel and placed them under the authority of lesser Elohim. Then in verse 17, it lets us know that these lesser Elohim were Shadim, the Hebrew word indicating guardian entities hostile to Yahweh. This passage parallels with Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 19 to 20, which outlines that God allotted the other nations to these gods, referring to these gods as host of heaven. Then in Deuteronomy 29, verses 25, we find out that the Israelites did in fact worship the Elohim that were not allotted to them. This same language is used in 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 13 to 23, where Micaiah bears witness to a divine council meeting. Now, I don't want to reiterate material that we went over last time, but it does bear repeating that these passages I just mentioned use the phrases host of heaven, God or Elohim, and demons or Shadim interchangeably. So when Paul warns about not fellowshipping with demons in 1 Corinthians 10.20, He's not doing anything innovative. He's simply referring back to the Deuteronomy 32 view. In fact, the word Paul uses to describe demons, daemonion, is translated back to Shadim, who we now know are Elohim. So if you still have doubts that this lesser Elohim even exists after examining the source material, then let me appeal to you by way of logic. Now, denying the existence of other Elohim would diminish Yahweh's place above them, as well as the sincerity of the biblical writers. For example, when we look at Psalm 97, 9, For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. If these were just made-up cartoon characters, then it wouldn't make Yahweh appear very powerful, now would it? The point is that among all the gods that exist, Yahweh is the most high and the only one who has the ability to create. So before I wrap up this message, I want to touch on how Jesus fits into the divine council model. And no, I didn't leave Jesus as a footnote, but it just so happens that his positioning here happens to be the simplest to explain. If we go back to our foundational passage, Psalm 82, that speaks of multitude, a multiple sons of God, then how do we rationalize Jesus as being the only begotten son? As per John 1.14, 18, 3.16, 18, and 1 John 4.9. Now, the problem with the phrase only begotten is that it implies that there was a time when Jesus didn't exist. 
he had a beginning, it also seems to contradict the language used to describe other divine sons of God. So when this phrase only begotten is translated into Greek, we get monogene. Now you see, originally it was thought that mono meant only and gene was derived from the Greek word neo, which means to bear. Now, years later, Greek scholars recanted this definition, now stating that monogene did not come from the word only, but represents a class or kind, as in one of a kind or one that is unique. Now, we know that Jesus is identified with Yahweh, making him unique or one of a kind compared to the other sons of God. This term is not in contradiction to the Old Testament. Now, how do we know this? Well, we can easily check this with scripture. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, Isaac is referred to as Abraham's monogene, or only begotten son. We know that Isaac was not Abraham's only son because Abraham had already fathered Ishmael. Therefore, this makes Isaac the monogene, or unique, one-of-a-kind son, because he was the son of the promise. So Yahweh is a unique Elohim. Jesus is a unique son, just as Isaac was a unique son. Are we with me? (laughs) Okay, guys. We're going to wrap it up there for now. Uh, Next week, we're going to keep cruising through Genesis. We still have so much to discuss, and I'm eager to focus on the rebellious council members and how their actions played a huge role in how God conducted his business from that point forward. There is still so much to discuss. So if you have any questions or you want to reach out, you know how to find me. Like I said, Please listen to the introductory messages if you haven't already. I've gotten a few messages already from folks who skip those who are a bit confused about what's going on. So if you still have questions after listening to those, I am more than happy to go over the material with you. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on the next one. Be blessed. Bye now. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Faith in 20. If you'd like to learn more about the ministry, reach out at faithin20 at gmail.com, on Twitter or on Instagram at faithin20.ministry.